thank everyone for coming out once again. Uh, I'm up here this time, a little bit better microphone uh, uh, access up here, and so I'm going to have to stand really still. So if you see me wander over here and you can't hear me, give me a funny look and I'll, I'll wander back behind the pulpit over here. Let's go ahead and start with a prayer. Our Holy Lord and Father, we come before your throne, humble to be in your presence, grateful for all that you've done for us, and praising your name as, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're so thankful for your word you've given us, and as we open it at this time, we pray you'd always give us soft hearts to hear it and be doers of your word. Help us now as we talk about children. We're so thankful for these blessings you give us and for uh, the design of, of the human family that you've created and uh, that we can pass these things on. And I pray that you would dedicate us each to uh, looking to that next generation and seeing them the way you see them and, and loving them and training them in the way they should go. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we continue on with this meeting. We've talked about husbands and fathers. We've talked about wives and mothers. But I want to talk tonight about children. And as you heard, the purpose of the lesson is uh, or or the, the title of the lesson is The Purpose of Children. But I want to start off by just saying it flatly. It is abundantly clear our culture hates children. Hates children. Doesn't like children. Doesn't want children to be around. You can see people complaining all the time about kids in public places. Kids shouldn't be allowed on airplanes. Kids shouldn't be allowed in you know, restaurants. Kids shouldn't be allowed here, here, and, and all these other places. And why does everyone have to bring their kids everywhere? And, and there's... Uh, literal online communities, uh, child-free or anti-natalist, and people saying, I don't want kids, anybody who does want kids is wrong, this is terrible, we need to convince as many people as possible not to have kids. Some of this is, is climate change activism, oh, our, our planet's too full, and so we don't need any more people, and so let's just all stop having kids. Others, it's just, hey, you know, it's inconvenient on my lifestyle. I, I wouldn't be a good parent because, you know, I just, I'm, I'm set in my ways, I like my way of doing things, and and kids would just slow me down. I wouldn't be able to travel as much. I wouldn't be able to go out to eat as much. I wouldn't be able to, to sleep in and just live the kind of life that I want to live. Our culture hates kids. Uh, we're going to go through some more examples here in a minute of people who even have kids hate kids. But not all of them, but some of them, plenty of them do. Satan, though, hates kids as well. And that's why our culture does. Is He doesn't want us to have children. He doesn't want us to pass on the faith. In fact, if you remember all the way back to the garden, we've been spending so much time on Adam and Eve, and the promise to Eve was, you know what, your seed and, and the serpent are going to be at war with each other, but your seed is going to crush his head. That promise of Jesus that happens right after the first sin, it's a beautiful thing. But what has Satan said about doing? He sees that plan coming to fruition, and so what does he do? As we talked about on Sunday morning, he attacks the family. He turns Cain against Abel. He turns everyone against each other. You see that through the, the genealogy that leads to the flood where Noah is the only righteous man to be found on earth it's because of, of the evil of mankind towards each other. But coming off of the boat, it, Noah's family is not immune as something happens with Ham and, and Canaan. And it goes on from there. And, and uh, each of those families, Isaac and Ishmael and Sarah and Hagar and, and Jacob and Esau and Joseph's son, or, I mean, Jacob's sons throwing Joseph into the pit, Satan turning the family against each other and trying to prevent this lineage, but especially it comes in to clear contrast in the book of Exodus. Satan uh, turns Pharaoh against the, the Israelite people and says, we're going to kill all of their sons. We don't want these people getting stronger. We don't want these people uh, growing in number as they are, and so let's kill all of their male sons. And you can go through the Old Testament and see how many times Satan attacks the family, attacks childbirth, attacks uh, all of these things that he doesn't want to have happen. But, of course, we see that echoed when Jesus is coming on the scene. He doesn't want Jesus to show up. He heard the same promise to Eve. He knows God's plan, and that's to bring this child into the world who's going to save everybody. And so what does he do when that child is born? Herod, that child's here to, to take your throne, have all the little boys killed. And that's what happens. So many of the boys are killed. Uh, you know, Joseph and, and Mary are able to flee with Jesus and he survives. But Satan hates kids. And you see that come out in our culture. You see that he has really two strategies to, to prevent kids or, or to uh, turn kids away from their parents. First of all, it is that prevention of children. It is Pharaoh saying, you know what, these people are going to be too strong if they keep having kids. These are really strong family people and families aren't good for, for us as our enemy to see those people flourishing as families, so let's cut off their families by killing their children. Herod does the same thing, preventing children. We live in this society where the abortion rate is astronomical. 
where, where people are killing their children and saying, you know what, I would rather not have one because it's an inconvenience to me. In fact, there's, there's kind of this trope out there that it's uh, the only people who get an abortion are the people that just can't afford to have a child. No, the majority of them are elective. The majority of them are, are a woman saying, I just don't want a kid right now. It doesn't really fit with where I am in life, so I'm going to go and get that taken care of, as they say. And it's over, it was now over 60 million since Roe v. Wade 50 years ago this year. You look at not only that, but the fertility rate. I brought up the other day, we are below replacement rate, and we're doing even better than some of the other countries. I read today that Spain and Japan, by the end of this century, will have halved their population. Everybody will be dying out, and they're not replacing themselves. In fact, they're replacing themselves at so slow a rate that they will be half the population. Satan is slowly bringing that world population down. You watch the movies, that's what the bad guys do. You look in the Old Testament, you look in the New Testament, that's what the bad guys do. A few years ago, they had the, the, the Marvel superhero Avengers movies. And the, the big bad guy, his plan was there's too many people in the universe, they're taking up too many resources, let's kill half of everybody. That'll make the, the universe a better place. You can see it, it's comical when it's a bad guy in a movie, but we're doing it to ourselves through this, these practices, through these decisions of people saying, you know what, I just don't want a child. And I read the stat the other day that one in five people today of childbearing age say, I don't want them. I, I'm just not interested in having children. So Satan is, is trying to prevent children from being born or even conceived. And then when they are, he tries to corrupt them. He tries to turn them uh, away from their parents. We read in, uh, the other day in Malachi, right at the end of the Old Testament, the promise that John is going to come and prepare the way for Jesus, and he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. Why? Because corrupted Israel, all of those relationships had been severed. Uh, Satan had gotten in and done a good job of turning the family against each other, and, and what John and Jesus, what they represented was that being changed. Do we have that going on in our culture? Absolutely. You look at the sexualization of children and, and those things that, that are going on, you, you see on the news and these shock stories of what they're trying to teach five-year-olds and the kinds of things where they have these books in the school libraries that a parent will get up and read at the school board meeting and he'll get kicked out of the meeting and say, hey, you can't read that in public, but they're taking them into kindergarten classrooms. Why? Because Satan wants to corrupt children. If he can't keep you from having them, he wants to turn them to his side. You see the, the radicalization of youth, these kids that go off to, to college as normal kids that love their mom and dad and love their siblings and come back lecturing their parents about all the evils that they have and, and you know, my family is toxic and I hate my family and I've got to correct them on all the ways they're wrong. I've seen this happen over and over and over with good church youth group kids that come back after a year or two of college, totally different people because Satan corrupts our youth. We talked the other day about generation wars, the, the boomers and the millennials and the zoomers and, and the, the dislike, the disrespect in both directions. Why? Because Satan doesn't like cohesive family units. That if you've already had the kids and he can't kill them off, at the very least he's going to try and turn you against each other because a strong family doesn't really work for Satan's plans. So he tries to prevent kids or he tries to corrupt them when they happen. We spoke on Sunday, and we, we've talked a lot so far about this atomization concept, that he works best when he's able to break everybody off into individual parts so that he can attack them without the support of a family, without the support of a community, of a church family. And that's exactly what he's doing with children. That's exactly what he's trying to do when he's trying to separate children from their parents is to make them more vulnerable and easily persuaded. But the problem with atomization is kids really gum up that system because... You can separate yourself from your spouse. You can separate yourself from your siblings, from your parents, from all those things. But when you have a child, especially as the mother, there is that connection there that's really hard to get rid of. That you can't just, uh, in most normal people, this does happen tragically sometimes, you can't just leave the child on the sidewalk and walk away and say, I don't have any obligation. This idea that we don't have any obligation to anybody but ourselves and what makes us happy, the moment a kid shows up on the scene, that goes out the window. That's why Satan hates kids. His plan doesn't work. His plan is exposed that we do have obligation to each other. We do have duties to each other as, as part of a family, as part of a, a society, as human beings. The, the minute you find out you were pregnant with a child, you find out, wow, I've got some responsibility. Wow, things changed. It's not just me on this planet here anymore. I don't just live for myself anymore. Uh, a number of you, you, most of you got to see the, the four uh, that God has blessed us with, I got to bring with me on Sunday. You know, I thought I was a, a decent guy, and, and 
uh, you know, real, real holy and strong and all that, and you have kids and they come into the household and you got to raise these babies that, that cry and wake up all hours of the night and all the things that they do, I found out I'm a more selfish person than I realized. I've got a, a lot of growing and changing to do because I have a responsibility to those kids to take care of them. Life's not just about me anymore. We live in this, society, we live in this world, this society that says it's all about you and what makes you happy. Children throw that all upside down. Children turn that, that, that switch on in our head that says, oh wow, I, I don't just exist for myself. There's so many times you read about people and, and statistically people's politics change, people's religious views change when they have kids. People, uh, so many times, and this is less and less by generation as we're a less religious people, but people who have drifted from religion, drifted from the church when they have a kid, in fact my own parents were this way, my mom grew up a preacher's daughter, had, was very, very much on the fringes of church. When they had my older sister, the firstborn, she said, all right, it's time to get back to church. I, I owe this child a religious upbringing. I owe this child to know God because you realize I am responsible for somebody else. And so if Satan can corrupt that or if he can prevent that, that's what he's going to do. So how should we think about children? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Again, so much of this is, is rooted in Genesis. When we talk about fortifying the family, you have to go to Genesis. That's where the family was created. That's got where God lays out why there is a family and, and what his purpose and design and plan for the family was. So in Genesis 1, we've read already this week in, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God creating human, creating man in his own image and in his own likeness. But verse 28 of Genesis chapter 1, it says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. You see, after the fall, Adam and Eve do that. They start having children, they multiply, the earth is beginning to be filled. But then you have the flood and you're back down to eight people. And you look at chapter 9, flip over a few pages to Genesis chapter 9 as Noah and his, his sons and their wives, those eight people come off of the ark. Things start to sound really familiar. You've got this, uh, in a sense, new world where everything's been washed away and you're back to this one family. Genesis 9, verse 7 says, As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. How should we think about children? What, is, what was God's purpose for children? So that we would fill the earth and take dominion over it. This is part of God's plan for mankind. And we looked at what he wants a man to do. And we looked at, last night at what he wants a woman to do and the roles we play together in that. And the natural result of, of them coming together is children. Be fruitful and multiply. I've quoted this in, in some of our work at Focus Press and had people get back to me and say, that's not for us. That was for Adam and Eve. That was for Noah. That doesn't apply to us anymore. Oh, I'm all ears for why not, but when did that stop? Where do we have a verse that says, oh, you guys have multiplied enough. If you want a kid to have one and if not, don't have one. See, the thing is, there's, there's biological realities. We, in, in our scientific brilliance, have decided we can kind of mess with that chemically and, and get involved and, and stop those things. But generally speaking, when a man and a woman get together, there's certain things they want to do. And when they do those certain things, certain things result from those. To, to speak about it uh, a little more generally, because we have children in the room, you know what I'm saying. God said, be fruitful and multiply. He made us as people who do multiply. So we would fill the earth and, and take dominion over it and, and exercise this, this plan that he had for Adam and Eve. God's the one that says multiply. Satan's the one trying to put an end to the multiplication. And we look at it today and go, no, it makes sense. We it just kind of choose, do what works for you. Do what, do what you think it should be. We look at Psalm 127. I want to read this one as well. Turn to Psalm chapter one, or the, the 127th Psalm. This is another one that's key for understanding this because again, we as a society look at children as an inconvenience. We, a, a lot of people out there hate children. Psalm 127, verse 3. And this one is written by Solomon, which is interesting. We'll, we'll bring him up a little bit later in this discussion. Psalm 127, 3 says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord, or a heritage, or a vintage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the child of one's youth, children of one's youth. Put a pin in that second verse for just a second. Let's look at the first of it in verse 3. Children are a gift or a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. It says they're a blessing. Our culture views them as, as eh, if you want one, great. If not, don't. 
they're a blessing. They're a heritage. That, that you look at all the people in the Old Testament that couldn't have children, of, of Abraham and, and Sarah, and you look at Samuel, uh, Samuel's mother Hannah, and so many of those that what they wanted in that day and age was children. They wanted people to carry on their line. They wanted children and grandchildren. And the blessing that was promised to Abraham was you're going to have nations come from you, as many as the sand on the seashore and stars in the sky. And we look at that and say, well, I mean, that's cool if, if, if you're into that kind of thing. You even go back to America's founding documents, and you notice a word come up a lot that the founding fathers were saying why they were doing all this. And this word that you see over and over and over is for us and our posterity. What's our posterity? Our children, our grandchildren. They're saying we're building this nation so that our family has a place to live that is a blessed place. That's a place that, that is prosperous and a place that serves them well and a place they can be a part of a safe and thriving community. They weren't just thinking about themselves and what made them happy. You know, I'd like to live in a country like that. For our posterity. We don't think about our posterity. We don't think about our heritage or our vintage or however your translation translates Psalm 127.3. And we don't think of them as a gift. And this thinking creeps into the church. I mean, our, our culture views, them, views babies as very noisy and inconvenient. And, okay, one or two is okay, but beyond that, nah, that's enough. Uh, I've known families, large Christian families, where they'll walk into a church building and get some really weird looks and get some really snide comments about how many children they have. Well, Psalm 127 says children are a gift of the Lord. They got a lot of gifts. They're, they're blessed in that way. And, and there's kind of this idea, in fact, I remember the dad of one of these families uh, that had a, a number of children, after a million of those comments, just kind of, I don't know if he said this to the person or if he was remarking this after he got one of those snide comments, said, Okay, which of them should I give back? Which one of them, like, can you take your pick of which ones I shouldn't have? Which ones we should just probably get rid of? They're amazing. They're all individual, unique blessings and, and wonderful personalities, and, and they bring so much to the family. And he says they're, they're a great thing. Now, uh, this was a father of nine. Most families aren't cut out for nine. Most of them aren't going to have nine. You don't have to have nine. The point here is children are a blessing, but even Christians often would quiz them about how many children they had. Why? Because our culture hates kids, and it teaches us to be kind of skeptical towards them, kind of view them as, okay, two or three, that's, that's good, and we'll stop right there. Any more than that, you're kind of being crazy. You go on from that that, you know, so many negative comments about teenagers. Oh, they're moody. They're, they're sullen. They're insufferable. Oh, you know, you're just going to have teenagers someday. And, yeah, I mean, they've got the, the hormones. They've got the things that they're going through. They can be disagreeable. Why? Because they've never been adults before. They're growing up. They're learning how the world works. They're challenging things. They're testing things. It doesn't have to be misery. It doesn't have to be this disconnect of, man, I hate being around them. They hate being around me. They think I'm a loser. I think they're obnoxious. And boy, uh, you'll, you'll hear Christians even say, man, almost 18. Almost got them all out of the house. I mean, yeah, they, at a, there's a certain point at which they do need to graduate and move on into adulthood, into achievement, into education or, or careers or whatever it is, sure. But this idea of, oh, we got to get rid of them. Now, my biggest pet peeve is the, uh, the, the memes at the end of the school year and at the start of the school year. At the end of the school year, you know, I, I see the teachers on my Facebook feed, you know, posting things about, we're free, finally, we're, we're you know, the, it's an empty classroom, and boy, finally, some peace and quiet. And then in August, when everybody goes back to school, the moms are posting their things of, oh, you know, the, there's the funny pictures, funny, you know, I was talking about on Sunday, we joke about the men in the family, we joke about all kinds of things, we joke about how... We're so happy to get rid of our kids. Why do we joke about that? And if at the end of the school year, the joke is the teacher saying, boy, they're out of my hair. And if at the beginning of the school year, their parents joke about, boy, they're out of my hair. Who actually wants these kids? At what point do you think the kids get the message of, man, nobody really, they're just shuffling me off, passing me off. I'm an inconvenience to everybody. That stuff comes through. You read the golden rule in Matthew 7:12: do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Could you imagine if everybody joked about you that way year in and year out? Oh boy, look, so and so's back in town. I can't wait till they're gone again. All right, they're gone. Thank goodness. I just, I've been so ready to get rid of them. Yeah, every now and then it's nice for my wife to have a date night and somebody to, to take our crazy little crew. It's not, man, I'm so glad. Oh, we're, we're free. No, it's, it's not that at all. Why do people talk that way? Why do we joke that way? In the same way we joke about disrespecting husbands because we kind of actually mean it. We joke about not wanting children or the inconvenience of children because we kind of think they are that way. Why do we do that? Because Satan hates kids and he teaches us to do that. So we have to ask our question that, that is the, the topic of the night. What are children for? 
what is the purpose of children? Why did God set it up this way, that, that uh, a mother and a father have children together in a family unit that they're supposed to raise up, and, and not just a mother, father, children, as we've kind of come to in the last 70 years, but grandparents, aunts and uncles, this, this community that raises up these kids uh, and, and brings them up in the way that God intended. Why? Look at Psalm 127.4 once again. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. They're arrows. They are part of this going back to the, the beginning in Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. That was right after they were told to take dominion and, and uh, rule over the earth. Why? What do you need to rule? You need arrows. You need children that you're raising up to go along with you in this mission of saying, we're God's ambassadors here on earth. We're going to be a family and a home, and, and we're going to bless our church and our community and, and everybody around us as God's people. But I can't do that alone. I need a wife beside me. And with a wife beside me, we're going to have children that are going to help us in that mission as well. They are these, these arrows, and we've got a quiver full of them to help accomplish this mission of taking God's glory all over the earth. That's what children are for, but the question is, and, and why this all goes wrong, we don't know what they're for. We don't, okay, well, I, I guess we've got some kids, and we're supposed to raise them up and feed them and care for them, and then 18, they're off to do their own thing. No, they're given us for this purpose, but then you have that question, what are we aiming them at? What is our purpose in raising them? If they're an arrow, what are we supposed to point them at? Ideally, it would be God's purpose. It would be to the glory of God. It would be so that everybody would know him through our family. And, and whatever careers and families and, and their, their life is going to become what it becomes, we need to shape them in that way. But their number one priority should be, I'm here to glorify God. But we aim them at, at things like career success. We aim them at things like having a good time. We aim them at things that, that the world tells us matters. Not having a family of their own, not, not looking forward to marriage and children and, and continuing this lineage on, we, we just kind of let the world handle the aiming part, and we just say, well, we'll feed them and put a roof over their head and, you know, kind of hope they, they get to where they're supposed to go. It doesn't work that way. You have to aim an arrow. If you've ever shot a bow and arrow, it's kind of hard. You've got to think about where you're shooting that thing. You've got to aim it precisely. I, one of the, the saddest memories I have in preaching I was preaching at a rural... Uh, congregation in eastern Colorado back when I lived in Denver. Drove a few hours out there on a, a Sunday with my, my sister in tow when I was in college age and um, went and preached and a nice couple invited us over for lunch at their house and we said, okay, we go, we go have lunch with them and three couples from the church were there and, and the two of us and you know they were asking us what you do. Oh, we're in college, we do this. And they started sharing about their kids and yeah, boy, my son is a doctor, and you know, my son is a, and all high achieving, all doing great in their careers, great salaries and all that. I said, oh, well, where do they attend church? Thinking, well, maybe they're in, in the city in Denver. Maybe I've run into them. Maybe I, I've heard of them or whatever it may be. Where do they attend church? And to uh, each one of them, all three families said, well, there is that one thing. What do you mean that one thing? Who cares if they make a billion dollars a year? What did Jesus say? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Man, boy, they're just doing so great. Well, do they go to church? Well, there's that one thing. Uh-uh. And, and we're going to talk tomorrow night about when families break and about families where, where the children have gone astray and, and strategies and what we can do. It's a very difficult situation, and I'm not here to, to speak on that tonight. We'll get to that a little bit more later. But for those that have children, for those that have grandchildren still in that that early phase, you don't ever want to be that person sitting around the table saying, well, there's that one thing. Now, Proverbs 22, 6 tells us that train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. And there's so much debate over, well, is that a guarantee? Is there, like, if you, if, if you do everything right, they're going to be Christians? Don't they have free will? Don't they get to choose for themselves? Yeah, but it's also not just a toss-up. Well, one family brings their kid to church every week and, and has family devotionals every night and uh, you know, lovingly disciplines their children and teaches them the scriptures and, and all this. And the other one, well, they skip every Sunday for the football game and you know, we see them at church four times a year and, well, it's, it's a toss-up. No, you have an effect on your children. You don't control them. You don't force them to do anything. But everything we talked about with the male headship of the family... Everything we talked about with the mom's role of the family, God designed it to lead to families coming together and, and passing on the faith into that next generation. Because there's, there's something about this. I want to look at another scripture in 1 Corinthians 3. Paul's not even talking about child rearing here, but I think it's very applicable to everything we're saying. 
as we look generationally, and as, as everywhere I go, I think I mentioned the other day, there are usually some children and teenagers in the church building, usually a lot of people 45 and up, 20 to 45 is the, the missing generation in just about every, every church building I, I've been to. That they're the people that there might be a few of them, but generally speaking, that's the lightest attended. We've lost that generation. In fact, if you look at that span, that's basically two generations. Statistics say it's well over 50% of those in those generations that grew up attending the church lose their faith. In fact, there was a Barna study that said functionally, like uh, of their beliefs, some of them might even still attend, but as far as what they believe, 80% lose their faith by age 29. Four out of five. If you have you know, five grandchildren, or if you can think of five children in this church, pick which one of them you want to be saved, and then the, the other four will just you know, we'll let them drift. It's horrifying. That's a statistic we have to reverse, and we have to apply ourselves to it. Again, we can't force them into anything, but the idea is to create a family culture, a church culture, give them the, the, the solid foundation they need to walk with the Lord all their days. Again, use them as arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior for this battle that we're in. Let's look at this text in 1 Corinthians 3. In verse 10, Paul's talking about his ministry. He says, According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. He says, we're building something, but how we build is the materials with which we build. Jesus uses the illustration of the wise man builds his house upon the rock. Interestingly, there in Psalm 127 we just read from, it says, they who, who build the city labor in vain unless the Lord builds it with them. There's a right way to build and a wrong way to build. And Paul says, look, if, if as ministers we build up a church and everything burns away and nobody's left saved, we're still going to be saved. We don't, you know, Paul says, I, you know, we'll keep our salvation, but we, we bear the cost of, of what was lost. When we look at our children and grandchildren, yeah, you might still be saved and that's a wonderful thing, but you also don't want to lose them. You don't want to build them on that foundation of straw that burns away or blows away and, and doesn't stand. So we have to think strategically. Because here's the other thing. We've talked so much about the, the wicked culture we live in. This is the greatest reason for optimism and the greatest reason for caution we have. Satan hates children. The people who don't like God, the people who are not Christians, the people who have no biblical values, they're not having children. You can look at the birth rates of religious people and non-religious people. They're not having children. And so you look at that and go, well, if, if Christian couples continue to go above replacement rate, one generation, two generations down, who's going to be in control of everything? Who's going to be making the decisions? Who's going to be uh, voting? Who's going to be all these? It, it's going to be people who are raised in Christian homes. There's one big problem. We've got to keep our kids. Satan's trying to prevent, uh, prevent children from being born. And if he can't do that, he's trying to corrupt children from being born. And so, yeah, you look at it and go, well, statistically, it's only a matter of time before we regain cultural influence as the church. True, if we stop losing 80% of our own to the world. And so, again, that is a great reason for optimism if we actually engage and, and get this right. So we have some pitfalls to avoid. Before, before our time runs up, I want to talk about a few pitfalls, and then we're going to talk about some positives that we can do to shape our families, to point that arrow in the right direction. And again, this isn't just for current parents. This is if you're going to be a parent someday. It's if you're a grandparent. And as we talked on Sunday, the church is a family of families. If you're not a parent or a grandparent, there are children around here you can help influence by engaging, by serving, by being a part of it. So this is for every adult in this room in some way or another. And, and honestly, for every teen in this room that's going to be a parent someday, Lord willing. The pitfalls to avoid. Number one, I... I this is, as I said last night, that was unpopular. This one's real unpopular, too. Public schools. It's an elephant in the room. It is what it is. I've got, I wrote a book. Uh, we've got the Focus Press table out there. I wrote a book almost 10 years ago now called Failure, What Christian Parents Need to Know About American Education. I started out writing it for one of those, you know, kind of how bad our schools have gotten thing. Well, number one, that was almost 10 years ago. The, the, it has fallen off a cliff since then. 
In fact, at that time, the, the big talk was the Supreme Court's gay marriage decision. And everyone was talking about what that's going to do to the nation. And I, I'm going to pat myself on the back here for a minute. I wrote in the book, said, yeah, everyone's talking about that. But here's the real issue. We're about to enter a time where boys want to go into the girls' locker room and say that they're a girl and vice versa. That's the next thing that's going to come to schools. Guess what you have happening nationwide is boys and girls attempting to claim they're the other thing and schools going, well, we have to allow this. We can't tell them that they're not. That was back then. But as I said, I, I set out to write the book on how bad schools have gotten so parents could see what's going on. And there's a lot of that in there. But there was something else I realized as I researched it. The message wasn't schools have gotten bad. The message is you are responsible for raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6 says. The stated purpose from the very beginning of public schools was, no, we need to get in between the parents and their kids. I'm talking about a man who signed the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Rush, said, no, we need schools so the, parents, so the students will know that they're citizens of this country first, that they don't belong to their families or to themselves, but to the nation. Uh, Horace Mann, the, the, considered the, the father of American education, the one that really set in place the school system we have, in the 1840s said, we who are engaged in the sacred cause of education must look at, at students and children as hostages that their parents have given to our cause. 1840s. This was always the design was people saying, the, the point of this is so that we can train you not to think the way your parents think, but the way that we need you to think. And so the question of public schools, when people say, well, our schools are different around here. No, they were all designed with that purpose in mind. And so when you have children in that education, I'm the biggest advocate for getting them out to homeschooling or Christian education if you can. If you can't, you have to understand what's being taught. And I, everywhere I go, people say, well, the schools are different here. The schools are better here. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe they are. There's kids in your kid's class that have phones. There's kids in your kid's class that are on TikTok. There's kids in your kid's... I mean, I live over in Dixon, rural Bible Belt, Tennessee. One of my, my distant cousins is a 13-year-old girl. She came and visited church here a, a few months ago, and uh, afterwards another of the family was talking to her, and she said, look, I know the Bible says all those things. I can't really believe that or say that I believe that because I think she said half of the kids in her class, 13-year-old girl, Dixon, Tennessee, half of the kids in her class identify as LGBT. When I was a kid, rebelliousness was dyeing your hair or getting a nose piercing or something like that. Today, rebelliousness is saying, uh, I'm a girl and I need to go get a surgery to make that happen. Uh, you know, I'm going to start dressing as the opposite sex. I'm going to turn my life upside down for all these things. It is a tough time to be a kid. And the friends and, and colleagues, the, the people your kids are going to grow up around, that influence is there. You have to be aware of that. And if you can't get them out of there, you've got to be doing everything you can to disciple your kids in the scriptures to let them know what's right and what's wrong because Satan is trying to disciple them in the, the opposite direction. It's no different. In fact, it may be worse when they get to the university level of the schools trying to teach them to hate their parents, hate their parents' values, hate the Bible, hate God, hate everything that's good and right because this change in culture that we're seeing. Why do we lose? It's not, again, it's not just a coin toss and well, I guess we lost 80% in this generation. Let's try the same thing again and hope it works better next time. No, Satan is actively trying to recruit your children away from you through these institutions. If you don't do something about it, if you're not combating that influence, he's going to win. You have to be aware of these things. So it's not just schools. It's not just uh, universities as they grow up. The phones they have. I am the biggest proponent in the world for as long as you can go without giving your child a smartphone, do not do it. When you do, show them the responsibility they need, and for the first few years, have strong parental controls. My brother works in, uh, he's a therapist, counselor. He works in addressing sex addiction more than anything else. He has guys come to him every day who've been viewing porn daily from eight years old because their parents put a computer in their room, because they were given a smartphone for school, because somebody at school showed it to them and they got a hold of it, and, and they've had the addiction for years and years and years. The statistics on that are well over 70% of men today addicted looking at that weekly or monthly. Even Christian men, even men that go to church. It's a heavy influence on kids. It's sexualizing them at a young age. It's, it's the issues that come with that. But it's not just that. It's the negative influence of the, well, the influencers on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube and all these social media places the kids go that are teaching kids what's right and what's wrong. It's discipleship. It's... it's 
training them up in the way that Satan thinks they should go rather than in the way God thinks they should go. When I was a kid, we, we had TV shows that we would watch, and there were a number of times Mom would come into the room and she had this, this knack. It was a God-given talent for walking into the room. We could watch three hours of TV, not that she let us sit in front of the TV all day, but we, we'd have it on for a long time, nothing objectionable. She'd walk in the room and they'd say a word and she'd say, all right, that's it. They hadn't done anything wrong the entire time, but when mom's there and she's thinking, what are you guys in here watching? It's just how it worked. I mean, that was, it, it, was, it kind of was a nice thing that, that she was able to have that influence. Now we give kids one of these and you give them a pair of headphones Nobody can hear what they're listening to. Nobody can see what they're watching. I, I've uh, seen kids everywhere I go, three years old with an iPad right here, and, and their, their uh, earphones, their headbuds, or earbuds or headphones, I'm going to get that word out here in a minute, plugged in. Nobody can hear what's going on. Well, at three, they're not getting into a lot of trouble. A kid that's got one in his hands at three years old, they're going to be an addict by six, seven, eight years old. They're going to be watching stuff they shouldn't that entire time. You've got to think through these things. You've got to think through what influences are coming into my house through the friends my kids have, the, the teachers they have, the books that they have, the, the media that they're consuming, all of these ways that Satan's trying to influence your home. Because as 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, bad company corrupts good morals. As Psalm 1 says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of uh, the, the wicked or stand in the path of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers. Don't be around those people. Don't let your kids be around those people. More than anything, don't let those people get a hold of your kids' brains and hearts and souls and train them away from you, train them away from God. It is a really, really tough time to get this right. I've mentioned a couple times, uh, my brother and, and Will Harib and I spoke in California last week, and there was my brother spoke on this very topic, and a, a lady spoke up afterwards and said, well, you're not going to like me because my husband and I did everything right, and our daughters fell away anyway. What do you mean you did everything right? Well, we had him in church, and we sent him to a Christian university, and she listed off, off a couple of other things. It's not a checklist. I can't give you a checklist that says, well, if you homeschool, and if you don't have a TV, and if you don't give them a phone, they're going to turn out just right. That's not how it works. What God has called you to do is look at everything that comes into your home, everything that goes out of your home, everything your family does, and say, does this help our kids walk closer to God? Are we a home that's going to teach people that it's good to follow Jesus? Are we a home that loves being Christians, loves the Word of God, loves each other? Are we a place where it's a joyful place to live because God's presence is in the home? Are we training them to know what they need to know? Are we training them to see the lies that the world is pushing at them? Are we sheltering them as they need it because they're not ready to fight those battles? And then training them to the point where they're, when they're adults, they are ready to fight those battles. We go two different directions on that one. Sometimes we shelter so much that when they hit 20 years old and the world hits them with, with all kinds of things they haven't seen, they fall apart. Or we throw them to the wolves and hand them a cell phone at 8 years old and they've seen it all. No, you've got to shelter them to a point to train them as arrows and point them in the right direction so they're ready for battle when the time comes. That, more than anything, is, is what I want to leave you with is... Don't think, man, how do we keep our kids safe? How do we, what do we got to do? And again, like that lady said, well, we did everything right. There's not a do everything right. It's go all the way back to Adam and Eve. Go all the way back to that concept of arrows. The goal that my wife and I have for our four is not, man, I hope they stay Christians when they're 18. I hope when they, they get out of our house, they go to college, when they, they grow up and, and get careers or whatever, I hope they stay Christians. No, 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 no. Satan's not going to know what hit him. Our plan for them is to know you are God's child and you have a purpose in this world to glorify him. And here's what it looks like. Here's how you operate as a member of the church. Here's your place in God's family. Here's what you need to know about why God put you here, why you're a boy, why you're a girl, why the, the Bible matters, why we don't give in to the things the world is teaching us, why we avoid certain people because they're bad, corrupting friends, why we go around certain other people and spend time with our church family. All of those kinds of considerations have to come into it. And so a few things of positive reinforcement I would recommend. Number one, family devotionals. I said this the other day. If you're a husband or a father, sit down with your family, read a little bit of Bible every night, talk about it, sing a song, say a prayer. It's that easy. We do that every night with dinner. It takes 15 minutes. Even though our kids are one through five years old, they get into it. They enjoy it. They help pick the songs. We talk about the Bible verse, and a lot of times it's over their heads. That's okay. That habit is going to be in there. And they're going to know this is a house where we talk about God's word. This is a house where we sing praises to God because we love him. 
This is a house where we pray and mom and dad pray for us because they care for us and we believe that God hears. Be a a home that's open to any conversation, any topic, any questions they have, anything you see, any of these wicked influences. They can go to Google. They can go to friends. They can go to a teacher. They can go uh, any number of places. They need to know mom and dad can have these conversations. I can confess anything to mom and dad. I can ask them any question about God and about the world and anything else. That only happens. You can't just say, well, I'm here for if you need me. No, you've got to initiate the conversation so they know they can talk to you. Have those conversations. One other thing that I've observed more and more, and and I think about this a lot since my children are so young, from a very early age, kids are very attached to mom. Mom is the dominant figure in their life through those first formative years. As they grow into uh, that, that adolescence and teenage years, that's where the dad really, really has to step in and, and have a greater role of helping your sons become men and launching them into that, that strength and knowing what their purpose is and how to operate in the world and, and how to contribute and be that virtuous man we talked about the other day. It's where a dad steps in and, and shows his girls, this is what you need to look for in a husband and I'm going to help you in that process so that you don't end up with somebody who's going to lead you astray and somebody that you can marry with and have children and raise them under the Lord as well. And so both roles, not that mom disappears from the scene at 10 years old, not that dad doesn't involve himself in the kid's life until 10, but you have to realize there's going to be different ways of nurturing and bringing them up and and taking those roles in your family's life. But I want to look at one more thing. I'm running out of time. I want to catch this one, and then we will will close with a song. But look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Again, this is Moses speaking to the people of Israel right before they're going to go into the promised land. The generation that gets to go in the promised land because their parents fell in the wilderness. He's telling them, here's what's going to have to happen. And in this chapter, he gives them all kinds of instruction. Number one, you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart. If you're going to pass it on to your kids, you have to have it. Number two, you're going to practice your faith. You're going to show your children what it means to observe the festivals and the the rituals and all the things we do as God's people. But I want to start right in verse 1. Deuteronomy 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. You, your son, your grandson. Why? So you can be prolonged in this land. He was giving them Canaan, and he said, here's your strategy. Not, well, and boy, try a couple things and hope it sticks. It's you train your children and your grandchildren. And so if you're a parent of young children today, you're not just thinking about keeping your kids faithful. You're thinking, how am I going to train them so that the kids that they have will also be Christians? How will my great-grandchildren be Christian? Now, what can I do to set up a family culture so that everybody knows we love our children, we appreciate our children, we don't hate our children the way the world does, we think they are a blessing from the Lord, and we're not going to let Satan come take them from us. We're going to make it to where uh, to everything that I can do about it is to show them that they're going to love God and they're going to train kids that love God who train kids who love God, that it's going to go on and on and on. And again, you look at those numbers, statistically, we're in a really good spot generations from now if we train our own, if we don't let Satan take our kids away from us for another generation and another generation. It's a beautiful thing that God has created with the family. And so as we look at at children, we look at the purpose of children. The purpose of children is to spread God's name throughout the world as we multiply ourselves the way he taught us to. If you have children, if you have grandchildren, think about what God gave them to you for and how you are engaged in training them up in the way that they should go. As always, the invitation is extended. If if there are those that have not put on Christ, have, have not been baptized into him, repented of your sins, confessed him as Lord, You're invited to do so. If there's anything you need to confess, there's always that invitation. But more than anything, as you leave here, I want you to think about, how am I contributing to this? If you have children, if you have grandchildren, do they know what their purpose is? Do they know what I'm trying to do with them as their parent or grandparent? If you don't have children, you say, how can I help families be stronger in my church? How can I contribute to this in some way? Think about those things as you go from here. Pray about it. Let's get this one right. If you have any need, come as we stand and sing.